Okay, let's get started, everybody. Uh, we are very, very lucky and delighted to have as our colloquial speaker this week, Professor Caitlin Cratter from University of Arizona. So Caitlin is, is an associate professor at the Student Observatory in Arizona, where she's been since 2014, following postdoctoral work uh, at Boulder, where she was a Hubble Fellow and also at the CFA. Um, as I'm sure you're all completely aware, Caitlin is a world leading expert on all things Keplerian, be it uh, binaries, planet formation, second binary disk secretion, and so on and so forth. And she's going to tell us today about a continuous theory of stellar system formation. So please welcome Caitlin Cratter. All right, thank you very much for uh, having me back. It's uh, great to be here again. Great to see so many people in the flesh in three dimensions. So it's a, a nice transition back. Uh, I understand we're in this gigantic room as a COVID precaution. So uh, I apologize for your great distance, but I'm also grateful for it for everyone here. But I hope that this will still maintain the same interactive, informal uh, uh, feeling that I know used to be the case in the smaller venues. So please, I don't think I have to encourage you to interrupt me, but because <laughs> otherwise this is terribly boring for everyone. Um, so I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about binary formation and planet formation. And I just want to start out with a little bit of motivation. Uh, as to why I want to talk about these two things together. So I don't mean to pose a phenomenological or very esoteric question, but I think it's important to think about why we distinguish between binary stars and planets in the first place. And one way I think it's useful to make this distinction is by looking at their metallicity here, comparing the metallicity of stars, planet Earth, and Jupiter. So they form a continuum in mass ratio. So if I take the mass of the object at the center, I can take a stellar companion, a brown dwarf, a giant planet, Earth, Pluto, and there's a nice continuum. And there's very little evidence for a hard break where there's a huge transition from things that look like planets to things that look like stars. Although I'll come back to that toward the end of the talk. But nevertheless, we see they also sample a very broad swath of metallicity space. So what fraction of these objects is not hydrogen and helium? So <clears throat> stars is typically a few percent. The Earth is nearly 100%. And Jupiter lives right in between at around 10%. And so the question is, how do we connect this continuum in mass from this very discontinuous nature in terms of bulk composition? So I will begin by talking about the models of binary formation in general. And I'll give a very broad brush overview, highlighting a few interesting pieces of the theoretical understanding along the way. And this is mostly coming from a recent PP7 chapter um, that was led by uh, Stella Offner with the sort of bulk of the observational statistical heavy, heavy lifting coming from Maxwell Bow. Um, so just some really fantastic work by him. Um, I'm also going to talk about how we can map these theoretical models with some understandable uncertainty onto these much better characterized stellar distributions. I'll then talk about how we can connect this up with maybe a more successful model for giant planet formation. And at the very end, I'll come back to how we can use all three of these things to maybe better understand this boundary between things that we really love to know as stars and things that we ought to think of as true planetary objects. So I'll start out with a big cartoon here that shows um, what I would say is what we should think of as the star formation process. And what I mean by that is binary formation. So um, as I think many of you are aware, binary formation is not some niche rare outcome of the star formation process, it's likely the default mode of star formation. <coughs> now, some stars end up single as our sun is, but we've been long biased, I think, by the fact that we orbit just one star, that that's the default mode of, of star formation. Instead, I'd argue there's a few different ways and scales on which binaries form through the general star formation process. So you have a molecular cloud of gas and dust. It's very cold, 10 to 20 Kelvin. It's also turbulent, sort of sonic, maybe transonic turbulence. Um, and within this cloud, we begin to form condensations that will turn into stars at the end of the day. And frequently, 
you don't form one in isolation, but you form two in close proximity with the right relative to the velocity such that they begin their lives as bound objects. Remember, the entire giant molecular cloud is marginally gravitationally bound. So the idea that when you begin and you get two condensations in close proximity, they're also gravitationally bound should not be a you know, great shock. This can happen on scales of tens of thousands of AU in these elongated filaments. This is actually a quadruple system where to the best of our ability to measure relative velocities from CO, they appear to be dynamically bound even at this very young age, maybe hundreds of thousands of years after the first core has formed. We can also form things in maybe quasi-circular environments. I, I, you know, even drawing an ellipse here is a little bit sketchy, but we have these turbulent blobs, and indeed, both in observations and simulations, we see the, the, that two X perturbations arise that turn into stars that begin their lives bound. If we go down to even smaller scales, maybe hundreds of AU, right, we'll get sort of a timing mismatch where one, uh, you know, an object is destined to become a star, forms its own rotationally supported accretion disk, and sometimes under the right conditions within that accretion disk, if it gets sufficiently massive, it can undergo another round of fragmentation by a different sort of gravitational instability, basically genes instability in a rotating disk, which is uh, tumor instability, and you can form secondary objects that will grow into stellar mass companions. And finally, there's another mode that has been popular in the literature for a long time that's called capture. Now, I'll argue that capture of two, you know, gravitational you know, unbound point masses in a star forming environment is somewhat unlikely. But if you account for the fact that gas is present throughout this process, um, capture actually can be relatively efficient. And it's really something that is hard to distinguish from this initial fragmentation. We're in the presence of gas, which is very good at removing angular and energy. You can have objects that begin their lives unbound, become bound through interactions. So zooming in on this picture, I'll start with this idea of turbulent fragmentation. And I'll just point out that there's still a lot of uncertainties in the detailed theory of how this arises. So if you give me a box of gas, uh, or, you, know, you can observe it, you can put it in, in your computer, and you shake it up, you give it you know, some amount of turbulence, you give it some magnetic fields, um, you turn on whatever other physics you want, outflows, feedback. I can't predict to you why this patch of gas turns into three stars and this patch of gas turns into one. We've been trying very hard to do this and there's no good predictive theory. I can't look at some blob of gas and predict its future, why it's gonna collapse, what the mass is gonna be. I can tell you that blobs of gas that are a little bit ma more massive turn into more stars, but I don't think that's a particularly useful analysis. You can look at our detailed inability to do that in this very nice paper that was read by Rachel Smolin uh, back in 2020. But even if we can't develop a predictive theory, we can still look at the outcomes. And we can see that we indeed form very different, you know, different configurations of hierarchical multiples. This is a quadruple system. And we also see evidence that over time, there's a little bit of that capture mixed in where we see uh, partner swapping. So you'll begin with two condensations that are bound, they will interact with another couple condensations, and we'll trade off which ones end up in the final outcome at the end of the star formation process. So there's a lot of flexibility in this. Um, I will point to, unfortunately, uh, Huang, uh, Xing Xing Wang is not here right now, but he's done some really nice work on the connection between this initial phase of fragmentation and a very unusual population of equal mass wise twins. Um, but it, it's, it's interesting, they may come from a different process than this, which I'll come back to later. So I, I've started off with a bit of a disappointing picture from a theoretical perspective where I told you I have no way to predict exactly the outcome of this. But one thing that we actually can do pretty well is model why systems that form on scales of tens of thousands of AU end up populating the binary distribution that I'll show you later, which is peaked on scales of hundreds of AU. And that's due to dynamical friction with the gas. So even though they start their lives bound, they end up at very wide uh, separations with potentially very high angle momentum and, and um, relative energy. And if you just make a very simple model for how they, the semi-major axis changes, as a function of the uh, change in the angular momentum and the continued accretion, right, where we model the change in angular momentum uh, as being entirely due to a very, very simple form of a dynamical friction force, which is just 
right? the accretion times the relative velocity of the stars moving through the molecular cloud and the dust, we do a remarkably good job, at least in the best cases, of predicting how their orbits decay in time. So this is uh, data from these uh, MHD uh, radiation and hydro simulations run by Aaron Lee a few years ago of a, a few uh, example pairs that I definitely didn't pick because they were the best fits, um, where the red line shows you that simple model and the black line shows you how the binaries are evolving as a function of time. So there's much that we don't understand, but I think we finally do understand how you get from fragmentation at very, very large scales of the core fragmentation scale down to the binaries that we observe today. Do they tend so to what the oh, right. Who wants to stop? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask uh, the dips there. I mean, it, the, it suddenly goes down and then suddenly comes back up again. So I'm plotting semi major axis because that's an easier variable. Or Aaron is plotting semi major axis because that's an easier variable to understand the magnitude of. But of course, what we measure is the uh, binding energy. So minus GM over 2A. So changes in mass from sudden accretion events can lead to discontin discontinuities in the semi-major axis. So I think that's what's going on here. That gives you one, one discontinuity in one direction, but not, that's just not obviously, at least to me, in the other direction. Yes, yes. So I, I don't think it's obvious why you preferentially see dips in one direction versus another, but there's also um, you know, localized interactions with dense other clumps. There can be interactions with third bodies. So there's other things like that that can give sharp changes in the total orbital energy that you measure in the system. And in fact, what you might infer, you know, if you're, if you're good at doing time scales in your head, is that you can look at the rate of decay here. What you can see is that it's not even clear that it's good to describe these systems instantaneously as having any given semi-major axis, right? Because what you really see here is a plunge. So the eccentricities can be very, very high. So they're not on purely radial orbits. Um, but they are, they're, they're evolving through semi-major axis parameter space on timescales that are comparable to that of a single orbit. So, you know, that, that's why I wouldn't over-interpret those, those bugs. Yes, uh, Chris. Has MG and angular momentum lost on the same timescale or is one lot less? Um, they're, they're, they're lost on a similar timescale, I would say. And again, to, to do that, to, to really know the answer to that uh, exactly, you'd have to really believe that you were you know, that the oscillating orbital elements that you measure represent an orbit, which I don't think they do in this case, because the um, orbital evolution time scale is so rapid. Well, but energy and angular momentum are always well defined. Sure, sure, sure. Yes, yes. So I don't think I have plotted uh, E dot and J dot independently for these cases. But I, I can't, I don't see why it wouldn't be about that same time scale. Uh, uh, so I don't know who's next. Uh, yes. What fraction of single stars? May have been ejected from multiple systems. Not a hundred percent. So I mean, I could, so, uh, so I'll give you a, a more complete answer. I could tell you statistics from this simulation set, but it would be but it would be misrepresentative because there's not enough stars in this simulation to be uh, a, a reasonable sample. I could tell you statistics from other people's simulations which have more stars, and that would give you a higher fraction. But I think those the simulations that have the best statistical sample have a set of initial conditions that over represent the degree of dynamic interaction, and that would give you a higher number. But I wouldn't necessarily believe that. Either. So I don't. I don't. I mean, I'll, I'll throw out a number, say twenty percent, and I don't think that could be wrong by an order of magnitude. <laughs> <laughs> Calculate this model curve. You need to know the gas density to compute dynamical friction. So yes. how do you? I mean, what, what density do you take into account? Because I mean, it's going to be by the right. so, so this is using basically a, a this is, this is done on like in the simulation on the fly. So it's the local gas density around the star in the in the simulation. So that takes into account perturbations on the fly. I can't remember if you use something like it, you know, the effective um, you know, I think it's something like the Bondi radius that he used for these calculations. I have to go back and look at what the actual sphere that he cut out to do the to get the V rel and the, the density. Yes. What are the masses of the stars and how massive is the cloud around them? Um, so these stars are typically of order of solar mass. Um, the cloud was it was a five parsec cubed box, and I think it started out with of order 50 or 100 solar masses in it. So it's a relatively small region. 
<laughs> okay, great. Um, so I want to briefly talk about the second mechanism for um, forming binaries, and that's from a gravitationally unstable disk. And I don't really want to go through the dispersion relations um, for you know, either of these dispersion relations in detail. I just want to put them up there as a reminder to you. So when I say gravitational instability, I suspect the majority of you in the room think of this, which is tumor raised cube. So sound speed, omega, it really should be uh, kappa, the epicyclic frequency over pi g sigma. So, you know, you're balancing uh, surface density g sigma. So that's uh, gravity against rotational and pressure support. Um, I think this is often useful to look at as basically some order unity coefficient times the ratio of the stellar mass over the disk mass to the aspect ratio. And if you look at a plot of sort of the disk to star mass versus aspect ratio, instability arises in sort of a fuzzy strip along here. And by instability, what I mean is the presence of it's a linear instability where there's a mode uh, with a given azimuthal number and wavelength that is unstable to exponential, you know, it's exponentially growing in the disk. The classic tumor cue that you know and love comes from this very simple dispersion relation, which looks, you know, basically like sounds like uh, sound waves, but with a rotational term. Um, and this is fundamentally for a very, very idealized, simple case. You're only able to consider an axi you know, axisymmetric m equals zero mode. It's for a infinitely thin disk. And um, that does a good job of giving us a general idea when instability arises. But if you want to understand this process in detail, there's actually really nice um, classic uh, analytic theory that goes much beyond this that includes the ability of different modes to grow and how these modes grow as a function of the, this J term here, which basically tells you about the total disk to star mass ratio. And if you use um, sort of this version of what's still, you know, a WAB analysis, uh, you get a sort of fuzzier boundary of instability because you get multiple modes that grow at different values of sort of the classic Turing's cube. And of course, there's a fundamental limit to um, you know, how massive you can make the disk and have something that should be described by gravitational instability because when you get up to this mass, mass of the, of the stellar mass, you know, sort of the, by definition, you also end up with an aspect ratio order unity, which I don't think we should you know, describe as a disk. Um, I'm putting this up here again just to, to emphasize if you happen to be interested in the technical details of gravitational instability and you're looking at papers on this subject, if the entire paper is written just in terms of uh, tumorous Q and they're, you know, providing some novel discovery as a function of one parameter, um, be a little bit nervous. Um, having thrown up dispersion relations, I'm now going to go back to looking at cartoons and tell you how I think this instability actually arises in the process of star formation. And I'm going to do this <laughs> and just put up a very simple order of magnitude estimate for the instability because I think it's useful. So the question is, how does gravitational instability arise in the context of star formation? You form one star, it forms a rotationally supported disk. And presumably at some point in time, that disk is not gravitationally unstable because it exists. So you have to form it. And that means that Q, or some property for that has to be greater than unity, right? The disk has to start out stable if it exists. So there's two ways that you can imagine taking this disk and turning it into one that is unstable. You can either change the temperature, cool the disk down, make the aspect ratio smaller, or you can add mass and raise the surface density. It's true disks can also grow, they can expand, but that's essentially doing one of these two things. A disk at larger radii is colder, um, and how do you get a disk to, to expand? You add more mass. Just general viscous spreading doesn't tend to produce the right surface density profile to take a stable disk and suddenly make it unstable at larger radii. So it turns out that if you look at the environment and, and opacities and surface densities uh, for star forming disks, they're predominantly heated by stellar radiation at large separation. So it's a bit counterintuitive. If you go to very interior regions of the disk, sort of viscous dissipation due to accretion can cause substantial heating. If you go to the outer reaches of the disk, that's very inefficient at heating, and instead the stellar source is the dominant source of irradiation. This matters because it means it's very difficult to take a disk that has some temperature that is set by the star at the center and turn it down. <coughs> and you have to somehow turn down the star to turn down its temperature. 
And that's a challenging thing to do to, to suddenly make a star be very, very faint. On the other hand, if you are trying to make stars, it turns out that it's very easy to add mass to this because that's the entire goal of this process. You're trying to make a star, which means the whole time you're continually adding mass to a disk, you're pouring mass on. And so if you look at the star forming environments, the way a disk reaches this critical threshold is not by cooling down, but by adding mass. And let me be very clear, when I say cool down, I'm not talking about the ability of the disk to radiate away its own internal energy. That is obviously happening, right? These disks are not, you know, adiabatic and just heating up all the time. That would give you something that was not a disk, it would be very, very, very fluffy. Um, I'm talking about literally changing the background temperature, which can only be done by changing the source of illumination. And the reason that this is so important is that accretion-driven instability is very, very good at making binary stars and very bad at making things like planets because you drive a disk unstable by supplying a whole lot of mass. And what that means is that whatever secondary perturbation you generate in the disk, it has a huge reservoir of material that's flying by which it wants to accrete and burn. Now, the details of this process are very complicated. I'm not going to talk about them here. Um, but just th that's one reason why I'll continue to argue through this talk that this process is great for planet for star formation, not so good for making low mass objects like Jupiter. Okay, so the next thing I just want to mention quickly is I started talking about how we get fragmentation at very large scales and dynamical friction with the gas moves those objects to closer separations. We know that there's another way to make uh, the separ separation distribution of stars evolve, and that's by interaction with the circumbinary disk. This can either arise because you have two stars that begin very, very far from each other, and they get brought closer, and then they end up embedded in a shared disk of gas and dust, or they can be born in the same disk. Um, either way, at some point, they will interact, you know, exchange energy and angle momentum with that disk. And in this case, the interaction is a little bit more complicated. And in fact, the direction in which this evolves is unclear, and it's probably a function of a, a wide variety of parameters. The good news is we know that at very small cubes, so for very unequal mass ratios, for certain parameter spaces in, in terms of the viscosity of the disk, we know that you recover the result you know from type 2 planet migration where planets move in. Um, so what I'm showing in this uh, plot right here from uh, Dempsey et al. 2021 is as a function of the effective viscosity in the disk and the mass ratio that you can get a parameter space where you see these plus signs um, where the migration is outward and then you get minus signs down at the bottom here where the migration direction is inward. So this is sort of what you're familiar with from planetary disks and this is what we think happens for binaries. So, but again, we, we find that the migration direction can be um, variable as a function of parameters of the binary and time. So making a clean prediction as to the final separation distribution remains um, out of reach right now from, uh, from theory, because we just can't model in enough detail. This was a subject of a KITP workshop um, that we held last spring. And so there's a lot of I hope, ongoing work on this that'll come out in the next couple of years. Um, I'll just highlight one other really interesting um, result uh, in this context, which is that the initial eccentricity also matters. So this is work from uh, Dan Delazio and Paul Ruffle showing that the uh, rate of change of the semi-major axis and the eccentricity is itself a function of the eccentricity of the embedded binary. And then at very high eccentricities, the disk acts to damp the eccentricity of the binary, and at low eccentricities, it acts to grow. And so you get these interesting attractors in parameter space where the sign of a dot and e dot crossover. Um, so again, I'm not trying to give you a predictive theory for how these objects evolve, but just to show you that the parameter space is quite complex and understanding uh, the details here on this crossover, you know, it depends on the cancellation of two very large numbers. Um, as with classical planet migration, you have negative torques from the outer disk, you have positive torques from the inner disk, you sum these two together, and you hope that you've done that well enough to believe the answer, whether or not you get a, uh, you know, a minus sign or a plus sign out at the end of the day. So with that, I want to move on to talking about how, even given the hand wavy nature of some of the physics here, what we can actually say based on the observations. Um, so again, I'm going to highlight some of the really nice statistical compilations from this new uh, chapter. And these are sort of the sort of main summary plots, which show you as a function of primary mass, 
the companion frequency, the uh, triple star fraction, and the multiplicity uh, fraction. So uh, just for those of you who are not familiar with looking at binary star statistics, just one thing to keep in mind, when you see companion frequency, you might be surprised to see a number that gets bigger than one, sort of a little bit counterintuitive if you haven't looked at this. What this means is on average, if I pick a star, how many buddies does it like to have in the system? If it is a number that is, you know, less than one, it means some of the time you likely find it by itself. And sometimes you can have one or more companions. If the number is greater than one, it doesn't mean that 100% of stars of a given mass are in multiple systems. It means that many of those systems end up having not just one companion star, but two or three or four. And you can see that this triple star fraction rises in lockstep with the companion frequency because more and more stars in high masses end up having more and more companions. So I want to zoom in on a few of the distributions here and just highlight how these things are connected to other theories. So um, what I'm showing here now on the left is semi-major axis in log space and the frequency of the companion fraction per decade in log A. This is for main sequence stars and this is for pre-main sequence stars. Now this is a very important distinction, right? We want to understand the star formation process and how we end up with the distribution of stellar st of stars that we see today across the whole universe. But if we want to connect it up in detail with the star formation process, we have to also look at the youngest system, not just the final product, because there's many things that can evolve over the billions of years that stars are doing the thing in the galaxy. So I'll highlight a few key features. So the first one, you may all be familiar with sort of the classic um, Dukina and Moyor or Radovan and all result of what the distribution of solar type stars looks like as a function of separation. That's this black curve shown in both panels. So most binary around solar type stars are on scales of our solar system, you know, 50-ish AU. And there's a tail going to very close separations and a tail going to very wide separations. But that does not hold true for all stellar masses. So the peak separation moves out as you go from M dwarfs to solar type stars, and then it moves back in. And in fact, if you were just looking at the inner binary pair in these very massive stars, blue here is O stars, um, green is uh, mid B, uh, they're actually even more peaked towards close separations because there's a lot of triple stars in here. So what you're actually looking at is the average distribution between the binary and the triple, which is biased towards slightly um, uh, larger semi-major axes. So you go from close separations out to where we are, for solar type stars, and then you move back. The other thing I want to highlight, and I'm hoping to have time to come back to this later, um, is that metal poor solar type stars have an enhanced close binary fraction. So as you decrease the metallicity of the star forming environment, you make more and more binaries with semi major axes less than 10 AU. You don't move them from the wide binaries. This is not a migration issue you're actually creating more binaries in the system. And you can see it's this, it's relatively sizable enhancement. And as you go to more and more metal poor environments, the distribution begins to map on to the more massive stars. So metal poor solar type stars, for whatever reason, have a distribution that looks like massive stars. And finally, um, I want to move to the pre-main sequence side. So in cyan here, you see the distribution of t tori binaries from some really nice work by Marina Kunkel, uh, from, uh, mostly from Apogee data. And you can see that it lines up perfectly with the field distribution of close binaries. What this means is by the time you're looking at stars that are a few million years old, all of the orbital evolution that they're going to do is done. So all of this process happens during the very youngest phases of the star formation process. So if you have a theory for making binaries that involves giga years, you cannot be producing the bulk of these objects. This is one of the reasons why I think the dynamical origins are often disfavored because they often rely on many, 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 many orbital cycles to bring binaries into close separations. Okay. Um, the final thing I'll point out is that, you know, I started this talk talking about formation mechanisms that happen on scales of hundreds to thousands of AU or even 10,000 AU. 
And of course, that's not where most of the binaries live today. But we actually see evidence if we look at the very youngest embedded protostars, that they are forming at these very wide separations. Now, there's some uh, missing data out here because it's very difficult to resolve very close binaries at, uh, you know, when they're deeply embedded in a molecular cloud. But nevertheless, there's, so there's some compelling evidence here that stars do really form on wide separations. So if I want to tell a little, um, you know, fairy tale about how we connect up these two, you know, this cartoon picture with the data, I argue that you know, we have pretty good evidence that stars do indeed, many stars begin their lives as binaries on separations out at this scale. We do observe them. Um, there's also evidence um, that disk fragmentation is producing a secondary um, uh, method for making binaries on initially closer separations of a border 100 AU. And I should point out that you know we have data actually observing disks that look like they have ongoing fragmentation and gravitational instability. And then at some point we need to get to this uh, field distribution. And so you know we go from things starting out at these very large scales, and we think that these two different uh, means of gas-driven orbital evolution, either through dynamical friction with the cloud or uh, accretion and uh, momentum transport within a certain binary disk can spread this distribution out. And the final thing I'll come back to is that the other thing we think we see is that disk fragmentation is more prevalent for both metal poor stars and high mass stars. And this is something that's actually predicted, at least for high mass stars from theory. Because remember, I told you that the best way to take a disk and make it unstable is to, to hammer it with a lot of mass and drive accretion really rapidly. Well, what do we know about star formation without doing any complicated models? We know we observe stars that are 1,500 solar masses. We know from the basics of nuclear fusion that those stars have to form on timescales of a order a million years, or else they would blow up before they form. And that tells you that they need to accrete 10 to 100 times faster than solar type stars, which means that you're driving material onto that disk 10 to 100 times faster. And so because instability depends on this rapid accretion driven work um, process, that means that they're more likely to undergo the instability. And indeed we see that there are more of them right at these uh, close separations where we would expect a, a larger contribution from this fragmentation. We also have some evidence for this from the mass ratio distribution. So what I'm showing here is as a function of primary mass, the power law index of the slope of the mass ratio distribution. What the heck am I talking about? Okay, if things are down here, and I, if I compare the masses of two binaries, it looks like I've randomly drawn them from the IMF. This is approaching sort of the saltier mass function down here. If they're up here, they're heavily biased towards being nearly equal mass. So what you can see is that across all the parameters facing the different separations and the different colors here, most of the stars do not look like they're drawn randomly from the, uh, the, the overall uh, IMF. So if the star is in a binary, it seems to know about its companion because their masses are more correlated with each other than you would infer if you just randomly picked two stars from your IMF bucket. As you get to closer and closer separations and lower masses, um, so this blue here is closer separations, uh, sorry, this, yes, closer separations, and low masses are down on this end of the plot. Stars know more about their companions. They tend to be more correlated in mass when they're close together or a lower mass. This is contrary to the conventional wisdom that you might have heard maybe a decade ago that massive stars are always in equal mass binaries. That is not statistically true. There's many binaries, many of them are close to each other in mass, but this preference for equal masses is more prevalent among lower mass stars and close binaries. And we think this is consistent with the idea that these closer binaries share uh, an accretion reservoir in a disk because that naturally drives things to higher, um, to closer mass ratios. Um, okay. So I wanna move on now from, yes. Can I come back to the prevalence of binaries and massive stars? Yes, this, you, this one or this just one? Just a basic story. So yeah. you argued higher accretion rates, more unstable. Mm -hmm. Of course, the higher central mass 
tends to stabilize you. Right. So it's not as I guess it's not as obvious to me that that story actually holds together. Well, okay. Think about it this way: um, if you if you just if you if you buy my argument that the propensity for instability depends on accretion rate, and essentially almost linearly because surface density and m dot are directly correlated, right? The effect of the massive star goes as root m. Right. So so the the stabilization goes as square root of m, and you now and, and m is increasing by a factor of you know, whatever, 10 to 100, but the accretion rate can increase by just one power of m. So even based on that argument, you would expect the instability to win out. Yeah. Regarding the maximum separation, so you, you may have some theoretical argument, like the typical molecular cloud, uh, core size, the summit scale, or whatever, but observationally, is there also a bias where you don't see anything more separated than the potential well, if you get wide enough, um, then galactic tides can start to rip you apart. Um, so that's one limit at the wide separations. Um, and if you also get wide enough that such that your orbital velocity is comparable to the velocity dispersion in the local cluster, that also can disrupt you on the wide scale. Yeah, and, and if you look at higher density stellar clusters, you'll see that the widest binaries don't exist there. Because they've been disrupted, you know, because their velocity, the velocity dispersion is com comparable to the uh, orbital velocity at the separation. So we do see some evidence for that. Okay. Um, that sort of answer, but there's, there's I, can, I mean, I can show you more detailed calculations, um, but I think that gives you at least a rough sense of why, why it works. Okay. So I think we're okay on time here. So I want to move on to talking a little bit more about planet formation, um, because a lot of the things I just talked about, you know, interaction with the disk, that, you know, should naturally make us think about planets. So how do these two things connect? So I want to highlight some of the big challenges of trying to understand planet formation, both in the modeling perspective and observations, um, and going back to this idea of thinking about the metal system. So fundamentally, right, we know that planets are metal rich, which means that they form from a small component by mass of the disk, which is um, you know, the dust. So if you look at the ISM, the dust to gas ratio is maybe 100 to 1. So you're taking all of the stuff that you have and you're saying, well, I mostly want to focus on 1% of that. So I guess those of you who do galaxies and cosmologies are familiar with this because you think about, you know, you think about stars and the whole universe is dark matter. But from those of, for those of us who think about star formation, it's sort of off point, right? That you want to get rid of most of the stuff. To make matters worse, of course, you can't see the particles that are the building blocks of planets because while very small dust grains are very good emitters, as you grow them towards planet, they become terrible at emitting, right? Rocks don't shine. So you've got no hope of detecting them ever, no matter how big a detector that you build. And if you really want to understand how planets form, you can't just think about these two things in isolation. You have to think about two fluid interactions, so solid gas instabilities, for example. And if you want to complicate things even further, planets don't live where they're born. So if you're trying to compile and compare demographics of the final exoplanet population with some planet formation model, you have to allow for very complex interactions. So uh, a one minute overview for those of you who haven't taken a planet formation class in a while um, of the classic theory of core accretion driven planet formation. So it has a few basic ingredients. Um, you start out with very tiny dust grains in the ISM, maybe micron size, uh, and they somehow begin to accumulate, probably through sticking, uh, to sizes of maybe microns or centimeters, or maybe a little bit larger. Somehow, things that we like to call planetesimals, uh, larger than a kilometer, form. And in the classic theory of planet formation, this is a little bit of a magic. Uh, step where they say, well, there's this feature size barrier where it's very hard to make any process work. Somehow we get over that and we get to large planetesimals that grow by gravity assisted collisions. And in some cases, these cores become large enough that they can actually attract a substantial hydrogen and helium atmosphere from the disk. This is a classic theory of core accretion. Uh, it is no longer either 1986 or 1996, so things have moved on from that. So if you haven't taken a planet formation class in a decade or so, or maybe two, um, or you never took one because nobody took planet formation classes, 
uh, 20 years ago, I'll just remind you of some of the substantial progress that has been made and then get to the open questions. So I've got the basic theory on this side. So there's a few updates. So first of all, we now have strong evidence that this coagulation state step is very efficient and happens quickly. Because if we look at very young discs, we see evidence of grains that are very different from the ISM. And if you just look at the overall mass budget, based on the dearth of detected small dust grains and the final abundance of planets, the grains had to go somewhere. And the easiest explanation is that they've grown and we can't see them. We also have strong evidence for structures in the disk that may be pressure traps that can help collect and increase the efficiency of the early growth. Um, going back to some uh, very foundational work done here in Princeton um, from Uden and Goodman, we also now have a much more compelling theory for how you skip over that magical barrier going from dust grains to planetesimals. There is a two fluid instability. It has the same name as the plasma physics instability, the streaming instability, where you can take a population of small dust grains and gravitationally collect them in the midplane of a protoplanetary disk into things that start out the size of asteroids and objects in the Kuiper Belt. And there's been some really nice work in the last few years looking at how the binary Kuiper Belts are reflective of this mechanism for forming planetesimals. These planetesimals then go on to accrete not just by colliding with bodies that are equal mass, but by collecting these small grains that grew in the first step. And this actually drastically changes the growth rates of cores and overcomes many of the time scale problems of the classic theory of planet formation. And then the last part is where I want to focus a little bit more on this, this last step here. So in the classic core accretion theory, there's this nice simple picture. If you could just get a big rocky core, getting a gas giant was easy because you could just collect up all this hydrogen and helium and grow to be very, very massive. Our more uh, detailed calculations in going beyond 1D, we now see that these flow patterns are much more complex than for certain planetary disks. And so understanding how planetary, planetary cores get their gas atmospheres is a subject of a lot of abject research. And I'll just point out what these things explain. So we now understand low disk masses, I'd say, and we can make uh, predictions that are consistent with exoplanet demographics. We saw the collisional problem of inefficient sticking of grains. We can dramatically accelerate growth of protoplanetary cores. And now we have to explain why we sometimes get small rocky planets with sort of moderate sized atmospheres and then rarer uh, giant planets and we don't get very many things that really undergo a very rapid runaway and get, you know, to grow to tens of Jupiter masses. Okay, so I'll just highlight a couple of these key uh, steps. So again, um, okay, I'll focus again instead on the growth of the gaseous atmosphere. So I'm um, highlighting some nice work from Bethune and Rafikov from a few years ago showing that you do a careful three-dimensional calculation of how gas begins to accrete onto a uh, protoplanetary core, um, you get very complex circulation patterns within the hill sphere. And so it's no longer a good assumption to say that once you just get a mass in a core, the gas will naturally accrete and you'll grow a sizable atmosphere. There's been more recent work um, by Xiao Wan Xu and collaborators, again, doing three-dimensional simulation where they include the luminosity of the central object. They explore different disk temperatures. They explore different opacity distributions and different dust populations. And in all of these cases, if you take the parameters that used to be naively predicting, oh, sure, you grow Jupiter in no time at all, all of a sudden the gas doesn't create at all. So in the classic theory of planet formation, people rub their hands about how you could possibly form the planets in our solar system before the disk evaporated. And now we've come full circle we're in the opposite situation where every time we do a careful simulation of the growth of a giant planet, we can't make a planet at all because the atmosphere just sits there in rough hydrostatic balance. So our contribution to this um, comes from some work led by Leonardo Kapp, who's a postdoc in Arizona, now he's a 51 uh, B fellow, doing some really phenomenal three-dimensional multi-fluid simulations. So he's not just following the evolution of the gas, he's not just following the evolution of one dust species, but 10 dust species. And this has been, been enabled by some really revolutionary algorithms that take advantage of GPU computing. 
And we've done a series of calculations now where we have a global disk with sufficiently high resolution to zoom in and onto the hill sphere of an accreting um, for the experts in the room. This is like a thermal mass planet. So the scale height and the bonding radius are, all, are basically the same, and the hill radius are all basically the same uh, number. And they just follow the evolution of multiple species of dust, and crucially, tracking the opacity inside the planetary envelope due to this um, evolving dust population. So in proplanetary disks, the opacity is all driven by the dust, but it's 1% by mass. And dust and gas are not perfectly coupled. They can move relative to one another. Gas feels pressure forces, dust does not. So these two properties, you can't just paint the dust on and paint on an opacity distribution to get the right answer. Yes. Do you also consistently capture the heat released by the sodium dust, by the accretion uh, of solids? So we don't have solid accretion in here. The radiative transfer runs that do everything self-consistently are running as we speak. So these runs are just tracking what the opacity is from the evolving dust population. And there is no luminosity from the core. There is, uh, yes, in this case, there's no luminosity from the core. In the calculations that are running at the moment, there is luminosity from the core. So what do you get? So if you properly account for how dust-gas interaction shapes the dust distribution shown in this color map, this is a sort of projected hemisphere of, um, of the uh, hill sphere, the body sphere, and this is the effective opacity uh, relative to what you would infer if you had a perfectly well mixed isotropic smooth dust distribution. And you can see that these two things are very, very different. Um, and so the result of accounting for this interaction is that you get an inhomogeneous opacity distribution that can allow for much more rapid cooling along certain directions. And so what you end up with is a picture that is fundamentally incompatible with a 1D model for planet formation, because you cannot simultaneously model optically thick radiation on a pole and opti optically thick radiation along the equator. So, you know, trying to get some midpoint in your opacity, is, you know, it's not the same thing. And I've, I think this is, sorry, it's in the wrong place on my, on my slide here. I put up a picture from, uh, some work by Mark Rumble back in 2009, um, then, you know, sort of following on the work of Wimar and Casanelli back in the late 80s for massive stars. So this reminds me a little bit of this radiative channeling that we see in massive star formation, where, again, the way that we solve the problem of growing massive stars is by either getting rid of dust or moving it into a non-isotropic distribution and allowing radiation to stream out in one direction and mass to flow in another direction. So as I said, in answer to Ramon's question, we're now doing the fully self-consistent calculations here where we're including the actual cooling that you get when you account for this uh, anisotropic opacity distribution to see if in least some cases we can overcome this new hurdle in planet formation, which is how you make a Jupiter in the first place. So um, I wanna come back in the last one and a half minutes maybe that I have to this idea of dust. So, I mentioned that the way that we've begun to solve this problem of planet formation is to go back and really think about what the dust is doing in a more careful way. How dust might grow early, how two fluid instabilities generate planetesimals, how the accretion of not just large planetesimals but small bodies rapidly accelerates the onset of core accretion, and also how the final stages are also probably modulated by dust. And so I started out talking again about how stars and planets have very different bulk metallicities. And so can we see the importance of this dust or metallicity in our star and statistics? So I'll remind you of a classic result, which many of you probably heard, which is that giant planet hosts are metal rich. <coughs> this result dates back to the very early days of exoplanet statistics to this paper from Fisher and Valenti in 2005. It's still true. The details are different. Um, Essentially, what we now know is that the most massive planets do tend to prefer metal rich host stars, and lower mass planets, not so much. But this is consistent with a theory that is where having more dust to begin with accelerates the onset of planet formation. So, this makes sense, I think. I want to now talk about how we can connect this with what, with what happens at the boundary between planets, brown dwarfs, and stars. Can we see the impact of metallicity? So first of all, 
we know that there are more massive planets slash Jupiter, super Jupiter slash brown dwarfs at close separations and wide separations. This is mass and Jupiter masses relative occurrence rates. If you go to closest separations and low, you know, and um, go to low masses, you see that there's more, right? There's an abundance of objects. So there's something that is liking to make objects that are maybe one Jupiter mass, making things that are in between is sort of hard. This is consistent with, an, with a theory where you make low mass things from one mechanism where you start with a rocky core and things down here are sort of the tail of the star formation distribution. But how do we connect this up with metallicity? So again, I'm showing you now a plot that's the mass of a closing companion. And on this side is a, a fraction of how likely this system is to have a wide companion. So you have a primary star, and I'm going to put another object next to it, very close. It could be a planet, it could be a star. And this is its mass. One Jupiter mass, a thousand Jupiter masses. This is a star, this is not. On this axis, low numbers mean if I have another object here, I'm not particularly likely to have a wide orbit companion of any other mass. If I'm up here, it means I'm very likely to have a wide orbit companion of another mass. You can see if I look at low mass objects, so I have my, my primary star, I have another gravitational potential in here. If it's something that looks like a planet, like a Jupiter, one Jupiter mass, less than Jupiter mass, a couple of Jupiter masses, it's not particularly likely to have a wide orbit companion. Yeah, I'm almost done. If I look up here at these massive objects, and so now I've got a star, and I have something that is another star, all of a sudden, these objects are really, really, really likely to have another object, i.e. be in triple star system. And this transition happens right around 10 Jupiter masses. So planets have their, have their uh, binary stars, another way to say this is binary stars suppress planet formation. Close binaries love to be in triple systems. 94% of binaries with periods less than something like three days have a tertiary companion. If I look at objects that are a few tens of Jupiter masses, are those planets, are those stars? Their statistics in terms of their companion distributions looks exactly like triple stars. It looks very much like they form from the same channel. If you look at planets, their statistics are very much consistent with what we see for lower mass planets, which is that if I put a binary companion nearby, it makes it very hard for one of the stars to form a planet. And on top of this clear distinction, between the low mass objects, which really look like planets, and the high mass objects, which look just like stars, there's a metallicity difference between these two populations. Um, I know both of these numbers are negative, but the overall metallicity of objects down here is higher than that of the field. So planets like to form in relatively metal rich environments. Over here, these close binaries, they have a much lower mean metallicity because. As I showed you before, the overall statistics suggest that close binaries tend to form preferentially in low metallicity environments. So I can see not just this, this uh, differ differential between the planetary population and the stellar population based on the companion statistics, but also on the mean of metallicity. And I'll just show you this plot to understand the suppression of planets. So this is now a plot of the overall planetary occurrence rate as a function of binary separation. And you can see if I go um, down here below 50 AU, the presence of a binary strongly decreases the probability of there being a planet in the system. And that's what's being reflected down here. Okay, I'm gonna skip this and just leave up my conclusions and take any more questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. I was just wondering if in your final connection between stars and, and gaseous planets, you could also add the rocky planets as like kind of a third group, or is that how does that fit? Right. So I mean, I think so. I mean, if you look at this this um, 
This is some work from Eric Pettigura back in 2018. Um, and so this is metallicity on the x-axis, the closed-in planets. And this is the planets per star. So this is the planet frequency. In um, green, you see super Earths, some Neptunes, Jupiters, and Saturns. So the, the, the fact that you see this continual decrease in the preference for metal-rich objects. So this steep red line here suggests that metal-poor stars don't make Jupiters, but they can sometimes make rock, they can make rocky planets with almost equal equal frequency, equal frequency. So I think it is continuous in the sense that as you decrease the amount of metals available, you're still able to make lower mass objects because your overall mass budget has gone down. <coughs> we have efficient mechanisms for concentrating those into rocky cores. But you maybe don't do it quickly enough to run away and grow a gaseous atmosphere. That, so, so I think it's continuous in that sense in terms of this metallicity argument. But the metal, you were saying that the metallicity is like, effect, like an order of magnitude higher for an Earth than for a Jupiter. Yes, because so there's the, but the overall mass is, is much more than an order of magnitude less than that for Jupiter. So the, I guess what I say is the idea is that all of the things that we call planets, they start out with the metallicity of 100% because they start out from coagulation of dust grains and growing into planetesimals and growing into protoplanetary cores. The question is whether or not they become, right, do they, do they then end up with a substantial atmosphere that reduces that metallicity from 100% to maybe only 10%. It turns out that getting from 100% metallicity to only 10% by like Jupiter is hard and only happens in rare cases. And maybe you might say, ironically, it happens in cases where you had more metals available in the first place um, because that accelerates the time scale. Um, I think there's maybe some interesting work to be done understanding how this process and the, the way in which dust suddenly happens and controls accretion might then uh, complicate this, this correspondence between metallicity and the final mass of planets, but that's work that we haven't done yet. So for the close binaries, why would a metal poor cloud be more likely to make close binaries? Why, thank you, Josh. Okay. Um, so I'll give you a hand, I'll give you the hand wavy picture. So um, it relies on understanding optical depth in two different environments. Molecular clouds are optically thin. If I take something that's optically thin and I reduce the metallicity, it cools less efficiently, less, less, less efficiently. So it gets a little hotter. Accretion rates are correlated with temperature. So a hotter cloud dumps material onto a disk faster. Disks, on the other hand, that are near the point of gravitational instability have an optical depth of order unity or higher. So if I take, and if I want my disk to fragment, I need it to radiate away energy efficiently. If I take something that's optically thick and I reduce the metallicity, I make it cool a little bit faster. So you have two competing effects. You dump material onto the disk a little faster because it's higher when you reduce the metallicity. And at the same time, you allow the disk to cool more efficiently because its optical depth has been decreased by the decrease in metallicity, and so it fragments more easily. And so I think these two things together give you a trend, and that's what I'm trying to show in this plot here. So the background color scale is the migration rate, the, the accretion rate, metallicity is on the y-axis relative to solar, and the radius in the disk where it becomes unstable is on the x-axis. I've marked the tau equals one surface, and basically as you go to lower metallicities, you get pushed to fragment at closer and closer separation because of the competing effect of lower metallicity in the core making it accrete faster and lower metallicity in the disk making it cool faster. Is that, you know, it's a little bit of a hand wave argument, but it, it seems to follow the trend. Okay, last one. Are there observations of these pebbles? No. The well, dark matter. Oh. <laughs> Um, there is observations of dark matter. Yes. Are you asking if pebbles can contribute to the mass of dark matter? No, no, no. They're a useful construct. Oh, yes. But do we really know they're there? Uh, I can go outside and find you some pebbles. <laughs> You're on the ground. Primeval pebbles. Well, right. So there's very good evidence for bodies up to a few centimeters forming early in the history of solar system from chondrules and things within meteorites. So if you take slices of meteorites, you can look at things that they basically look as though you've squished together a bunch of pebbles. 
So there is meteoritic evidence. It's not just the pebbles on the ground out there. We can't see them in exoplanetary systems, but we see them in, well, in meteorites. So in, in chondrules, yeah. are, are primeval pebbles? So yes, yeah, so radiometric dating suggests that the yes, these inclusions in meteorites do date from the earliest stages of the solar system. Good. And if there's meteoritists in the audience, I apologize for that oversimplification, but um, Okay, we'll pass the hour. Let's carry on the platform.